Greetings from Asheville, North Carolina on this nice spring day. Today's class is on the principle of least action. And I will be getting a lot of ideas from Richard Feynman and a student of Richard Feynman's, Elisha Huggins. Elisha Huggins, I had the pleasure of meeting many years ago at a physics teacher uh, con uh, convention. And he told me that when he worked with Feynman, that what impressed him uh, one day when he was showing Feynman his calculations is that Feynman would then come up with new notation that would be so, so compact that he could fit his calculation in the margins. Very nice. Well, Elisha Huggins uh, published a nice paper in 2010, giving us a game that Feynman developed in the early 1960s at Caltech in a class for advanced students in gravitation. You take two clocks, put them on the table. You take one, I take the other, and we can do whatever we want with the clocks, but we have to bring them back in one hour. And the winner is which clock gains the most time. And we'll be looking at concepts in general relativity where the altitude affects the uh, time of the clock and also the movement uh, affects the time of the clock, special relativity. And uh, this will be coming from Elisha Huggins' paper at 2010. And then after we do that, we'll go to uh, Feynman's uh, lectures uh, for freshmen at Caltech in the early 60s where he uh, shows how to get the Euler-Lagrange equations from uh, the principle of least action. Very, very beautiful stuff. So I hope you enjoy this class. It has fascinated me for many years, this concept of the Lagrangian. And I'm sure you will get a lot of insight after going through the calculations in this class. Thank you. Class W. The principle of least action. Part one is gravity time and Lagrangians. That title is inspired from a paper by Elisha Huggins in 2010. And the text that goes with this class has the, uh, the reference. I recommend that you look it up and read it. It's a very nice paper. Elisha Huggins studied with Richard Feynman, got his PhD at Caltech under Richard Feynman. I had the pleasure of meeting Elisha Huggins. And we're going to be using uh, his ideas in his paper that describes a game invented by Feynman in the early 1960s. But before we do that, let's review some elementary physics. The concept of work. Pick up a stone. So here we're going to take a stone, it's on the ground, and pick it up gently to a height h. Now the work that's done on this would be the force to pick it up is mg, and you multiply by the distance, because your concept of work is force times distance. I like to think of this formula as the formula that you would use to pay people pushing boxes in a warehouse to load up on a truck. You would pay them if they traveled more distance. In other words, they were pushing boxes from the far end of the warehouse to the truck. And you would pay them if they were pushing harder, if the box had, let's say, a refrigerator, something larger that they were pushing. And if they pushed against the wall and didn't move, that'd be a waste. You wouldn't pay them anything. Say, hey, you're not doing any work. And if they had their arms out and were walking like zombies where they were had distance but no force, they wouldn't be getting paid for that either. So there you have the force is mg, the distance is h, and there's the work. Then for the second uh, consideration, we're going to look at the case where we drop the stone. 
So here you have the stone at rest. You're holding it up. And then you're gonna let it go and have it, have it come down to the ground. All right, now for this, let me go ahead and choose coming down as positive. So then the uh, work in coming down, the force is, I'm gonna use F equals MA, and the acceleration is the change in velocity with respect to time. So if I'm coming down here, I'm gonna have, here the force is M dV dt, and then dz is going to be uh, the, the distance part. And then I'm gonna look at this and say, if I have a delta V over delta T and a delta Z divide by delta T and multiply by delta T, then this delta Z over delta T is a velocity. And here, I'm gonna let this delta T cancel that delta T so that this becomes M V D V. So there's the DV. There's the V and there's the M. And we're gonna integrate from zero to V. We're dropping it. So that means we get M V squared over two. Look at this, this is nice. This is the famous formula. One half M V squared. And we call that the kinetic energy. So in the introductory classes, they have the definition of the kinetic energy, which is the one half M V squared and then they had the definition of the potential energy, which is MGH in this particular case. And then they say, well, let's look at what happens uh, with total energy, we're gonna add. And for total energy, uh, at the top we had a stone, if we drop it from rest, there's no speed but we have MGH, so we have potential energy. So you have kinetic plus potential. And then when it gets to the ground, you have the one half MV squared, but then you're on the ground, so you get zero. So here we're, we're using the ground is zero. Uh, it's what usually is done, H um, equal to zero on the ground. And that's your formula. So the general form you would have is one half MV uh, squared at the, one position and the MGH at the one position is one half MV the second position squared plus MGH2. All right, so now we're ready to drop a photon. What do you mean drop a photon? You can't drop a photon. Photons always travel the speed of uh, light, but what we mean is let, let a photon go down, all right? They actually did an experiment like this many, many years ago, I think it was in the 60s, uh, where they had a photon come down and what happens is the photon gains energy, it, it shifts, the wavelength shifts slightly. Now you can't change the speed of the photon. The light travels over the speed of light, but uh, blue has more energy, shorter wavelength than red. And so if you go up, the, red, the light would stretch get more red, less energy. Remember your formula that the energy for a photon is the Planck constant times the frequency. So if you gain energy, you're gaining frequency, and that means if you start out with green light, you're moving toward blue light. Blue light has more frequency, and then violet would even have even more, and then ultraviolet, and so on. So here, if we drop, from, I say drop, but we're really moving from point one to point two uh, with this photons moving down, then we're gonna have, see at the beginning, uh, we're gonna have here the energy of the photon is gonna be H frequency at the top, and then there's gonna be a plus, and we'll use uh, say a Z here for the height, some, uh, some Z. And then when it cuts down to the bottom where Z is zero, you would have H times the frequency at the lower place. So that frequency is gonna be greater because of adding these two together. So the light would be slightly shifted toward the blue, a blue shift, if it's going down toward the surface of a planet, say. 
And then uh, here, if you want to look at this mass, the effective mass of the photon is given by Einstein's e equals mc squared. And here, since we have energy, this is HF, the effective mass of the photon is HF over C squared. So we're going to substitute that in for that M. So let's do that. And then we'll have uh, the formula. We'll have HF1. And then for the potential, we're going to have plus for that mass, we're going to put in HF over C squared. And the G and the Z are still there. The H and the F2 are still there. So now with this result, the H's cancel. And you find that the frequency of a light at the lower position is equal to, we're going to factor, uh, do a factoring here, factor out the F1. So this is going to be a 1 plus G Z over C squared and F1. So I wrote the F2 first on the left. So that's a nice formula. And then you might recall that the frequency and the period are related by the reciprocal. So the period is one over the frequency and vice versa. Like if some system uh, has a period of a half a second, then one over a half is going to give you two. It's doing it two times a second. Or if the frequency is four times a second, then it says it takes one fourth of a second, one over four, uh, for it to do it once. So th that reciprocal relationship means that I can write this as T1 and then 1 plus GZ over C squared and this one is T2. It basically flips. Now this is a, a result that is a general relativistic result, general relativity. It's telling us here that if we're, if we're looking at uh, this T1, this is the higher, the higher clock, this higher clock is, is gaining, gaining time. This is basically saying a clock at height Z gains time. So I'm gonna call this the change in time or the increase in the time, it's gonna be an increase of general relativity, is gonna be this extra piece here. So it's gonna be GZ over C squared. The clock at height z, as it, as it ticks away, like if that's a second, there's like a fraction of a second more uh, for this one compared to the one here that's down on the ground. That is a wild result. Now, you may recall from special relativity that the time in the laboratory is equal to the proper time that's a clock that's moving in some frame. Divide it by one over V squared minus C squared. And here, this uh, is the result of movement. So in special relativity, we're talking about frames of reference. And this is the famous result, sometimes called a time uh, dilation. or some stretch of the time. And what we're, look, what we're interested in looking at is to compare this to the moving frame. This is where we're, this is in the frame moving. So I'm gonna write this down as a T naught, that's in the moving frame, is one minus V squared over C squared T in our lab frame. So that means if we're moving, you're gonna lose time. And you may remember the twins paradox, you know, one twin goes, goes out there near the speed of light and they're not aging as much. So you might say that their, 
their second is less than a second or a fraction of a second less. So uh, here uh, we're going to uh, look at a Taylor series expansion. And if we uh, expand this, we're gonna look at here, this is a one half. This is gonna be equal to approximately one minus one half v squared over c squared. For our game that we're gonna play shortly in the lab, we're not gonna be moving the clocks very fast anyway. And that's your Taylor series expansion. It's always good to remember if you have one, uh, say, uh, plus some epsilon quantity uh, to the nth power, that's pretty much, it's gonna be one plus n epsilon. So this is going to be your, your delta. So here the change, or the, the delta, the loss of time, special relativity, loss of time, if you move is minus v squared over two c squared. Beautiful results, these two uh, formulas, from general relativity and special relativity. Now we're ready for the Feynman game. Now the Feynman game is that we have a table in a room, and the table has two clocks on it. All right, so we have a clocks. And you're gonna take a clock. You, me, I take a clock. The Feynman game. And this dates back to the early 1960s where Feynman was teaching a course, advanced course for grad students and for uh, physics, advanced physics majors, uh, where he came up with this idea. Uh, right around the time, the early 60s, when he was doing, he did his other course, the famous I mean, lectures uh, for, uh, for the freshmen. So here, you take one, I take one, and we can do whatever we want in the room, but in one hour, we have to come back. And then the winner is, is going to be the clock who gives, gains the most time. So the winner is the clock with uh, most time gained, all right? So if your clock is behind, that's not good. If my, if my clock's ahead, I, I gain time, uh, then I win. So what about some strategies? Well, strategy one is you should move your clock as high as you can because that's gonna be an increase, positive, and the Z, if Z is big, you're near the ceiling, you're high up in the ceiling, then that's gonna be good for you. But you gotta be careful here because when you move, you're gonna get penalized. So let's say for the motion, it's a complete waste of time to go sideways. It is a waste to go sideways. Because if you go sideways, you don't gain any height, you don't gain any time, and since you're moving, you're losing time. That's bad. And then three, when you move the clock up, don't speed up too much. If you speed up too much, vertically, that works against you, all right? That loses that loses time, too much time. So that's, that's wild, all right? So then here, the uh, change or in time for the player is gonna be equal to the sum of, of the time that's based on the general relativity, all right? That's gonna be the delta T general relativity plus the delta T special relativity, which is gonna be a loss. This is basically a loss, and this is a gain. So you wanna get that clock up high, but not move too fast to get there. So the gain's gonna be your GZ over C squared, and your loss minus V squared over two C squared from the master formulas. So this is your GZ over C squared, your gain, and the other one is your minus v squared over c squared. So the score, 
your score or my score would be to sum up from here, we'll go from N, we'll just say from one to 300, uh, 3,600 seconds. So basically the 3,600 seconds, we're going, we're going to do all the seconds, um, add them up and see wherever you are after one uh, second, one hour, one hour is gonna be 3,600 seconds. All right, so we have this first term and then you get penalized for your velocity to c squared like that. Okay. Now let's uh, look at this in terms of an integral. If we uh, put delta n here, we've done this trick before, delta n is one since each, each second you take, you know, n is three, subtract n is two, you get one. So the delta n is one. And we're gonna uh, go here to the integral. So the delta score, say t score for the integral, you're gonna integrate, uh, say here, uh, from the zero time when time starts and go to one hour, one hour. And remember uh, for your transition from a discrete sum uh, to an integral, what you do is you let the the delta n be a dn. You then rip off the subscripts, become a continuous variable there, like this, and you change the summation sign into a snake. So that's what we have. So what we need to do is here to win the game, we want to uh, maximize, maximize this then you win the game. Of course, you have to uh, have as high a number as possible, positive number of gain uh, to win. So now what we're gonna do here is multiply through by minus mc squared. Now, if I do that, then I'm gonna be interested in the minimum because I'm gonna be uh, multiplying by minus sign. So let's do this, minus m c squared times the score and that's going to be from zero to one hour the minus sign will make this minus sign a plus sign c squareds will cancel and you'll get here one half m v squared this is a square from here put that square in there, I had left that off initially. And I'm gonna use the T for the time variable. I'm gonna let the N, I'm gonna call this here a D, the DT. It's more, more common to, to use T. And then this is minus, uh, the C squared cancels, and there the minus sign is gonna be there, M, G, Z of T. And now, this is amazing. You get that minus sign. So, so this is gonna be called the Lagrangian. So you'll be, this is the Lagrangian. So this is the minus sign shows up now. This is beautiful. Because you would think like uh, the total energy, you know, we added the two together and what's with this minus sign? You know, what's, what's, uh, what's about that? And it turns out that's the gain. Uh, this needs to be minimized, minimized to win the game. That's what you want. So this is called the action. This whole thing's called the action. By definition, this is the action, and we want to minimize the action. And the Lagrangian L is what we have inside here. It's one half m v squared uh, minus, and I'm gonna go ahead and put down uh, v of x, um, as usual a case like n g h, uh, or you have one half kx squared for a spring. So we'll go ahead and uh, look at this. This is basically potential, this potential energy term. So we're subtracting potential energy. So we're doing kinetic energy minus potential energy. That's what the Lagrangian is. To take the kinetic energy and minus the potential energy. Beautiful.
I'll see how that comes from. And now we're going to move to Feynman's uh, lecture uh, to the uh, introductory students where he uh, does this beautiful calculation to show you that when this is minimized, when you basically minimize this, you get Newton's law. All right. And that's what we're going to do, do here. So this is uh, W2 least action. Now this is in Feynman Lectures, the volume two, chapter 19, and dates back to the early 1960s. And we're going to look at your, say, T and say X of T. And we want to find out from going from, path, from point A to point B, let's say that the straight line is the ideal path, all right? And we'll call this X bar of T. So we're gonna call this the ideal path. That means if you're on that path, you're gonna have the minimum case. You're gonna win the game, all right? The Feynman game. And then say someone else is doing the wrong path. They're like doing this and doing all kinds of crazy stuff there. As time goes on, they finally get there to point B. But if you look at, say, a certain point, say here, that is off base because the correct, the correct place would be, say, this distance here is X bar. That's the correct value. So this value here, I'm going to call that uh, eta is the error. This this is the de the deviate the deviation the deviation or the error. So the path that the uh, other person's taking the x that they're taking, say some arbitrary uh, path, that x has two parts. You can write that x of that general path as consisting of the X bar to get you up to that perfect ideal line, say, case, and then you can add the, the error. So this is X bar T plus the DV, the error, the error, okay? So we have that set up like that. And then, uh, we want to note that if you look at, let's say, the time that you start, like at this point here at A, this point here at A is going to agree with the best path, and there is no error, because you have to start here, and you have to end up at B. So therefore, the arbitrary path has to agree at the endpoints, all right? So in other words, the eta equals zero at the endpoints. That's required. We must start together and end together, all right? So now we're ready to do some, some neat work. Uh, we'll start off with, we need the velocity, so the dx, dt consist of two pieces using the formula. It's the derivative of the ideal path, respect to time, plus the derivative of the, the error, because your path is not, not the good one, all right? So we get those. And then we're gonna look at, let's write down the action the action is to go from A to B. It's one half M V squared, it's kinetic energy, minus the potential energy. All right, that's what we're trying to get a minimum for, all right? So the method is to write this in terms of the ideal path and the, the error, and we're gonna do what's kind of like the max or min kind of a problem 
uh, at the la at the next step. But for now, let's let's just plug in. So here, if we plug in, we go from A to B. You have one half m, and then this derivative is going to have two parts: the x bar part plus the r derivative, and that's going to be squared. And then we're going to subtract. This x is going to be equal to the x bar plus the deviation, and that's going to be integrated, the dt. All right, so now we're going to work things out. And when we work this thing out, we're going to see here we would get a dx bar dt. Uh, uh, that whole thing is squared. And then there'll be two for the cross term in here. And then there'll be the last term. Now we're doing a problem that's similar to what we do in math class where we have the max min. If we have an f of x and an x, for example, we're doing something like this. And this is what we're solving for. At this uh, minimum, the variation of the function is zero. That's a fancy way of basically saying that if you take the derivative of the function df dx, that's zero. It's flat there. There's no slope. No slope. So near that place where we're interested in, the deviations are very, very small. All right. So therefore, uh, since that's what we're going for, we're going to let this go away. We don't need that. It's going to be very super small. And then for the v, we'll do a Taylor series expansion. And if you do a Taylor series expansion on, on something like this, you would get, for example, here, uh, you would have the, uh, the function, let's say here, uh, at, at the ideal point plus here the derivative, all right? And that's going to be at some small uh, deviation. And, you know, if we work this out, we would have then one half second derivative, and this is going to be then eta, eta, squ eta squared, for example, excuse me, eta squared. That's your Taylor series expansion. You can think of this as expanding about, this is x bar plus uh, eta. So it's, you're expanding about the eta, the Taylor series expansion, and we're uh, here going to neglect anything that's quadratic and higher. All right. So if we go uh, to the next step, we're going to write these out. We're, we neglect uh, the small quantities. So the S is going to be from A to B, one half M D X bar DT squared, uh, plus now that, that two will cancel the one half and we'll have here m dx bar dt and first derivative in the eta. And then minus this v of x bar and then uh, minus the v uh, prime eta. And that's going to be then a dt. Now, if we look at this and ask ourselves the question, what is the variation here from the ideal? Because see, this is ideal and this is ideal. So if you look at this first term and this third term, that's the ideal. That's the, that's, that's the part that has the, uh, the X bar. That's the ideal one. So the, the error or the variation from the ideal is going to be from A to B, it's going to be the other stuff. It's going to be the M, the X bar DT, the E to DT, and then minus the derivative here with the X bar. I uh, lost, lost some X bars here. These are our X bars because we're expanding, we're expanding that out. So there's an X bar there. So now we're good. I think we have it in good shape here, uh, dt, all right? 
And we would like this for the ideal path. This is going to be zero. There's going to be no vari variation. In other words, we want to set this equal to zero to find out what the ideal is. And that's uh, like setting this derivative equal to zero in the freshman calculus classes. In other words, the variation of the f at that low point is going to be zero. So here, uh, what does this mean? Well, we want to get this arbitrary parameter outside so we can then set everything else equal to zero. And so to do that, we need to free up, we need to free up the eta here. And to do that, we do integration by parts. Or to lift that derivative off, you can think of it as doing uh, the uh, product rule. All right. So if you look at the product rule, for example, the d dt, what are the two uh, ones under consideration? Well, it's, I have this dx bar dt, and I have this eta. So if I come in here, I'd have the second derivative uh, times the eta, so derivative first times the second, plus uh, the first times the derivative of the second. So what I want to do is I want to get rid of, see this. Uh, this will free up the, uh, the uh, parameter, just like this is already freed up. Then I can pull it out. And then this is easy to do because if you have a derivative and take an integral, you're just going to lift it, lift the derivative sign. So therefore, the variation here is going to be this thing minus that thing, all right? So from A to B, we're going to have the derivative of dx bar dt eta. And uh, then we're going to have uh, here, okay, we're going to have then a minus, uh, minus sign. And that's the second uh, derivative. There's also an m in here, the second derivative, all right, times the eta. And then we'll have this uh, other term that is still there, dt. All right, now this thing, if you look at this thing here, that's just going to lift that off. And when that lifts off like this, and you evaluate this at a and b, what did we say about a to the error at the beginning at the end? We said there, there is no error. Like you have to start at a and then go to b. So therefore, this is going to be zero. And then we're going to be left with, for the variation of the action, from A to B, we're going to have uh, minus signs uh, here everywhere. So we'll write, we'll just write these out. Minus M, second derivative with respect to time. There we go. And then we're going to have minus the derivative of the a potential function, then we can pull out that eta. And since this is arbitrary, because you're taking these many wrong paths, these bad decisions, all right? Therefore, this has to be zero, and that means the variation of the action is zero. That's like your minimum case, like, like taking your derivative of your function, or having your variation of your function being zero. And so that is gonna be the key so what is that key here? We have then uh, minus m second derivative like this minus the derivative on the potential is equal to zero. And that means m second derivative of the ideal path equals minus dv dx. Now, this looks very familiar. Uh, this is uh, MA, and the derivative of the, for, of the uh, uh, conservative, uh, for, and we have the conservative force, the derivative is going to be giving you a negative derivative of the force. So, uh, remember uh, some similar ones here, like you have MGX, uh, for example, DV, uh, DX with a minus sign is minus MG. You're pointing down. Uh, gravity, and if you have a V for springs, one-half kx squared, 
when you take the derivative and slap a minus sign on, you get here minus kx, you get Hooke's Law. Guess what? F equals ma. Amazing. So we start out with general relativity, special relativity concepts, played some game, found out that you had to uh, have the minus sign between the kinetic and the potential uh, energy uh, for the game, all right, uh, here. So that arrived at the Lagrangian. And then to make the Lagrangian work with the principle of least action, find its minimum, you get an F equals MA pops out of it. So that's very, very, very nice. Uh, very, very elegant. So let me just show you the Euler-Lagrange uh, formulas uh, here. Uh, there's, there's several in different, you know, more than one in different dimensions, more dimensions. But here we have one dimensional case. So if the Lagrangian, here's your kinetic energy, one half m x dot, your velocity squared, using the dot notation, minus your potential energy. Then if you take the derivative of the Lagrangian, I'll say partial derivative because I have an x dot and x, with respect to x dot, I get m x dot, which is the momentum, all right? This is your momentum, all right? And then if you uh, take the derivative with respect to x, the partial, if you come in here, you can use now the regular derivative since the v of x is just v of x. All right, you have this. Then you would uh, say that this is the derivative, you want the derivative of the momentum, so then d dt of the partial out respect to x dot is going to be equal to this is your this is your ma ma and this is going to be over here your force this is going to be your force so a very very nice result uh, this is an euler lagrange equation so that's euler lagrange equation and in three dimensions you're going to have you know three of these and they'll be referred to you know as the euler lagrange equations you know one for x and cartesian course one for x one for y and one for z uh, they're a very very powerful uh, approach uh, here to solving problems uh, it's an advanced form of f equals ma advanced form of f equals ma but it has some great advantages because with F equals MA in complicated situations, you get force diagrams with vectors and all that can be really, really hard to work with. But here, if you write things in terms of the Lagrangian, which is a scalar, and then you, uh, you know, take these derivatives, you can get a lot done. And so they're very, very powerful in theoretical physics. That concludes our class. I hope you enjoyed this uh, class that had concepts of general relativity, special relativity, the Lagrangian, and a minimization principle.